How wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to discuss one of the most famous supernova remnants out there, the Kepler supernova. And mostly because something really unusual has been recently proposed in regards to the supernova, suggesting that it actually might be the first ever example of what the scientists refer to as alien type supernova. Uh, aliens, you know? But yeah, not these kinds of aliens. So let's talk about this recent study and exactly what this means. But first, a super brief review of some of the most famous recent examples of powerful supernova near us. And I think the most important and the most influential is actually right here, SN 1987A, that though it didn't happen in the Milky Way galaxy, did happen pretty close. This was the Large Magellanic Cloud. And technically this particular explosion significantly boosted the interest in astronomy mostly because it was such an incredible event and because it was easily visible to the naked eye. But what about some of the most recent supernova right here in the Milky Way? Well, for many, many decades, it was always believed to be this. The Kepler supernova, also known as SN1604, the one we're discussing today. But in the last two decades, scientists actually discovered that this is maybe not true. This was the last visible supernova that could be easily observed by anyone, but there have been some more recent ones that surprisingly were missed by a lot of astronomers. You can learn about some of them in some of the videos in the description. But today we have very strong evidence that Cassiopeia A also experienced a supernova sometimes in the 1600s. But even more recently, possibly in the last 140 years, this particular supernova, G19, would have been visible as well, but it was not because it seemed to be blocked by a lot of dust. It seems to be only visible in the X-rays. Naturally, when it happened, we didn't really know what X-rays even were. But for some reason, a lot of early astronomers in the 1500s and 1600s got super lucky. Because during the period of just approximately 30 years, and just as astronomy started to pick up, scientists were able to observe some of the brightest and some of the most spectacular explosions in the night skies. And the first one was this, SN 1572, also known as Tycho's supernova. And this was also visible without any telescope and appeared in many different historical records. But then, 32 years later, we had something even more impressive. Something that was described in The Stella Nova, a book you see right here written by Johannes Kepler. And so it was actually this German astronomer that conducted the most accurate observations of the supernova back in 1604. And though it was approximately 20,000 light years away from us, it was ridiculously bright. So bright that it was also visible to Chinese, Korean, and Arab astronomers for at least three weeks. We basically get descriptions of this particular new star in a lot of different sources. And because the description was so accurate, we knew exactly where it most likely happened. And, well, you're looking at the supernova remnant right here. The remnant that once again is 20,000 light years away. But the only way it could be visible to the naked eye is actually if this was a really powerful explosion. In this case, it was most likely a type 1a supernova. A result of carbon-oxygen white dwarf exploding once it reached its Chandrasekhar limit. Or basically for a white dwarf, once they reach 1.44 solar masses, they can no longer hold together and they end up exploding. And though even today it's not entirely clear what seems to cause these explosions, we seem to have two main explanations. Either some kind of a donor star that allows the white dwarf to suck up a lot of mass, eventually reaching this limit, or maybe a collision between two stars, specifically two white dwarfs, that when combined reach this limit. Either way, even today, no surviving source has been discovered, and there seems to be nothing inside this remnant, implying a type 1a supernova, and implying that if there was a remnant, it's no longer in the region. But this was only discovered in the 1970s, and one of the first unusual discoveries was actually its Speed. Turns out that this gas bubble was not just expanding, it was also speeding away from the galactic center, technically toward us. And it was moving so fast that it was escaping the galaxy. Which is a little bit unusual. It essentially suggested that this original star that exploded, the original white dwarf, was also moving pretty fast and was actually coming from an entirely different region in the galaxy, or more likely, from outside of the galaxy. And so here, by reanalyzing the motion of the Kepler star, or the progenitor that probably existed here prior to 1604, researchers behind this study concluded that it probably came from a different galaxy. In essence, making this the first example of so-called 
alien supernova. Alien type 1a supernova. The first such example ever discovered. And specifically this was done by comparing the motion of the gas with a lot of nearby objects and a lot of stars in the vicinity, mostly using some of the more recent data from the Gaia Space Telescope, which is known for tracking billions of stars across the Milky Way galaxy. But also comparing this to some of the velocities from previous galaxies or from previous leftovers that used to orbit the Milky Way galaxy before the Milky Way absorbed them. And here the overall velocity does seem to match various galactic speeds, but not the stars. Suggesting that whatever this Kepler star was, it was moving much faster and in a very different direction from all its neighbors. And suggesting that it came from somewhere else. And though it's unclear exactly where it came from, in this study they do explore some of the smaller ancient galaxies that collided with the Milky Way, such as the Kraken galaxy, Helmi and Sagittarius. And none of them seem to match. But the overall conclusion is that wherever this came from was probably some kind of a smaller satellite that eventually merged with the Milky Way, but possibly left very little behind. And if the authors in this paper are correct, here they also estimate how often such events might occur. And apparently this would be super rare. This unusual alien supernova might only happen once every 60,000 years, or approximately 1% of all supernova in the Milky Way. And so if this is confirmed and if this is true, Kepler might have actually gotten super lucky. But naturally, because of this somewhat unusual proposition, there have already been certain criticisms. And one of the biggest ones, and actually one of the biggest issues with this study, seems to be the data used. Specifically the velocity data for the supernova itself. Here the authors relied on much much older measurements from the 70s and from the 90s, simply because we don't have anything newer. And back then the precision was not the same as it is today. And so there is a slight chance that the velocity here might have been overestimated. And so this could only be confirmed with some of the additional observations using some of the more modern telescopes. Likewise, without seeing the remnant or without seeing the donor star, it's going to be impossible to prove any of this, especially due to these uncertainties and the lack of precision when it comes to measurements. If somehow researchers are able to find this progenitor donor star that's believed to be approximately 4 to 5 solar masses, by measuring its motion, it might be able to prove this once and for all. Now since the supernova here happened over 400 years ago, that particular star, if it still exists, should not be too far. But at a distance of 20,000 light years, it might be kind of challenging to find it. And so until that star is discovered, or until researchers can find some additional evidence, it would be very difficult to state if this is indeed the first ever alien supernova. The anomalous high velocity was measured 3 to 4 decades ago, but we don't really know how accurate this really was. But assuming that the scientists in this paper are actually correct, it also means something else. Here they also suggest that the formation of the star system was very likely the result of the galactic murder between Milky Way and that smaller galaxy billions of years ago. In other words, the origin of the Kepler star can possibly be traced to that initial galactic merger that eventually destroyed its home galaxy. Which presents us with quite an intriguing scenario. So basically here, billions of years ago, as the Milky Way galaxy was growing, it absorbed some kind of a smaller satellite that eventually created a bunch of over densities in the galaxy, while also shredding the galaxy into these stellar streams similar to what you see right here. And one of these newly formed stars was potentially some kind of a binary containing two relatively massive stars, very likely F-type stars, possibly 3 to 5 solar masses in total. And a star that's about 4 to 5 solar masses is estimated to live approximately 500 million years. After this it becomes a red giant and slowly becomes a white dwarf. But then following the formation of this white dwarf, it started to slowly absorb the mass from its partner and eventually grew to the mass where it basically exploded. But the initial star formation seemed to have happened at least 500 million years ago, implying that this is when this galaxy was absorbed. And so this particular study does present us with a really intriguing explanation for this somewhat unusual supernova. But once again, because it uses a lot of older data, we don't really know how accurate any of this is. And so some of the future studies might help us resolve this, but until then, I guess we can assume that maybe Kepler's supernova was actually a lot stranger than we initially thought. But if you'd like to find out about some other unusual supernova, check out some of the previous videos in the description. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can actually discover a lot more videos, quite a few you've never seen before, 
and all of them without any ads, or join the channel membership to discover some additional footage. Or maybe just buy the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.